Okay, good afternoon everybody and thanks for joining us for uh, our latest installment of the Coach Development Webinar Series. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Andrew Abraham, PhD, with us this afternoon, who's going to be uh, discussing the connection between theory and, and practice. Um, as previous webinars, if you can keep your microphone on mute, that would be fantastic. Um, if you've got a question, feel free to put them in the chat box and if we feel it's appropriate, then we'll, uh, myself and Ricardo, will filter them and, and, and ask Andy, but if we can keep them to the end, that would be great. Um, and as previous, the webinars are being recorded uh, and we'll be sharing them afterwards. Um, and the final thing to say is that if you do feel like your device has been hacked, then please uh, try to exit the webinar. Um, and if we do suffer a breach, then we'll uh, probably ab abort uh, if we need to. So. That's all I need to say. I'm just going to turn it over to Andrew now to make a brief introduction about himself and crack on with the presentation. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, Bobby. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for, for coming along. Um, uh, and thanks to you, uh, Bobby, for, for the invite. It's, um, it's always good to share some ideas around, um, especially if we can put the word uh, theory into something without people just running away. So I've got you, on, got you captured in the room now, apparently. Um, so yeah, brilliant to see you all. Um, so we'll, we'll spend a bit of time, as, as Bobby says, talking about this idea of, um, of theory, but uh, we'll perhaps just uh, look at some issues around what that means and, and just try to uh, deconstruct what we mean by that term. So uh, it perhaps gives us a, a point to, to have a chat with each other about, um, I'll probably go for about half an hour-ish, um, it might not even be that long. Um, I've got some backup slides which we can use to perhaps uh, look at some other things uh, if we need to, but um, otherwise we can crack on. Uh, Bobby, do you need to stop sharing yours or do I just go straight to mine? You can click straight, uh, if you just click share, Andy, you should be able to crack on. All right, yeah. Uh, so here we are. And if I present that, so everyone's, can everyone yeah. see the presentation? Yeah, all good, mate. Yeah. Yeah, be good to go. Right, excellent. Um, okay, so this this is the um, the question I've thought it would be useful for us to talk about. Uh, what is theory based practice? Um, we may get into this idea, which some of you might have seen shared around Twitter, which we've referred to as professional judgment decision making. Um, but we'll see where we get to. But I think it's the, the perhaps hopefully the, the the more interesting bit to get into initially is this idea of theory based practice. Um, and this is where everything slows down. Oh, it's because I'm, there we are. Um, here we go, sorry, there we go. So one of the questions where, when I think it's important for us to perhaps get into, if we look at theory-based practice is to go really to first principles and ask this sort of question of what is coaching? Because um, we don't know what coaching is, but how can we be sure if we know we're doing theory-based practice? So. There's a couple of things which I think are important to get into from this. One is we can look at it, if you look at it from a linguistics point of view, anything with an ing on the end can be either a verb or a noun. Um, so, so as a verb, it's something that is done by someone. If it's a noun, then it's something that we can see. So we might say, well, I'm going to go and watch Bobby coaching. So therefore I'm watching something happen. So therefore it's a noun. Um, whereas Bobby might say, I'm off to go and coach, so that I'm going coaching, and therefore it becomes a verb, that's what he's going to do. Um, and if you, depending on which way you look at that, then brings a, about a way in which we might want to think about things. So personally, I think it's good to think about it as a verb, but there are some coaching models that exist which look at coaching almost as a noun, and you can tell whether or not there are coaching models that, that sees it as a noun, where it includes coach and athlete. So therefore, if the model includes coach and athlete, that it means you can see both at the same time, so therefore it's something which is going on. Um, but for the time being, let's stick with it's something that coaches do. Uh, and that then has implications for what we do and, and how we present coaching, how we get by it, and therefore how we perhaps look at what we think theory-based practice is. So hopefully that, that gives us a, a useful place to start from. By the way, is, as I'm speaking, I've got the, the group chat up, but if, so if someone's got a question about something that I'm talking about at the moment, feel free to type it up. If I think it's worthwhile answering at that point, I will do. If not, I'll leave it till we get to the end of the, when, when I finish talking, if that's okay. Um, 
so um, so when we look at this, this is I do a lot of this work within my role at uh, Leeds Beckett University, where uh, I'm the head of subject for sport coaching, and we spent a lot of time working in both coaching and coach education. So we've done a lot of work with the FA. So apologies, these are going to be football um, pictures rather than handball pictures. Um, but it's we we basically challenged the FA with the same questions as in what is coaching? Do you know what it is you're trying to develop? Um, and when I work with coaches in uh, and coach educators in football, they'll almost always refer to it's something that's done on the grass. Um, and clearly that is where a lot of coaching time is spent. So if I go coaching, if I coach and I coach in the grass, I am coaching. Um, however, it, I think it's important that we perhaps look beyond that because if we look at it as something that a person does, then if I class myself as a coach, then I'm coaching there. But equally, if I'm sat in a meeting with fellow coaches or a board of directors or other people that I think are influential and I'm doing planning, my planning as a coach is coaching. So in that, in that picture I've just put up there, that is the, or those two pictures I've put up, in both those situations, that is a coach doing their job, so therefore they are coaching. And I think we'll both, hopefully we'd all agree that those are things that coaches do and are an important part of what coaches do. Um, it could be that as a coach, I have to speak to parents, therefore I'm coaching. I might have to speak to the media, so therefore I'm coaching. I may have to stand on a touchline somewhere and shout at people, hopefully not, um, but we might move on from that, uh, and therefore I'm coaching. And so all of those things are, are contexts which, within which I'm doing my job, so therefore I'm coaching. And we might then go beyond that and say, but that might just be about a single session. It might be around a season or it might be about multiple seasons. So suddenly we've gone from coaching being something on the grass to something much bigger than that. And as a result, I think one of the things we then have to get into is, well, what's the common theme across all of those things? And the common theme is there is a person doing their job and the job they do is called coaching. So that is what I am doing. So it's the verb that I think we're interested in. So we might then go get into a, what is it that this person is doing? Um, and I think the common theme throughout all of those is this, is that irrespective of which of those contexts I'm coaching in, I'm having to think and do, I'm doing something. I, you know, so the, the Descartes view of the world, I think, therefore I am. So I think, therefore I'm a coach. So irrespective, and one of the things I didn't put in there is probably, as you all know as coaches, is that you might be sat eating your tea and your respective partners might look at you as if to say, are you thinking about us or are you thinking about coaching? And yes, so we get some rise smiles around that one. Um, so even then, you know, we're thinking about coaching, we're reflecting about coaching, then that is a coach doing their job. So the common theme throughout all of this is the thinking processes that coaches use. So therefore, I think it's really helpful for us to try and to explore what's actually going on there. Um, so this is, if you like, the, um, here we go. This is the bit where I get into this idea of judgment and decision-making. I'm going to hold off on the term professional at the moment, but I'm going to talk about judgment and decision-making. From a very simplistic information processing point of view, me as a coach, so I coach, uh, as much as I'm a coach educator at Leeds Beckett University, I also coach the, um, my local rugby team. They're under 13, so we're going to under 14s next year. So when I perceive my, what I'm going to do with them, I'm, I'm taking in information. There is, a, there is a perception of information. Now that information might be written down as a club policy. It might be listening to the players. It might be listening to the parents. It might be writing, me writing things down and crossing them out. It might be me actually delivering something and, and seeing how people respond to that. But there is a perception of information. And once I have that information, I then have to start forming a judgment with what I think that, that information means to me. And as I do that, as I start to enter that judgment, I'll start to engage in some form of decision making. And as in, this is what I'm now going to do. That that decision 
will lead to some sort of behavior. And that that behavior then has some form of consequence. And that consequence then becomes the perception of new information. Now, it's a re now you'd look at that and it's a relatively common information processing view of saying it's a, it's a, a, it's a looped base exercise. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. In fact, no, it's worthwhile exploring this a second. If we look at the way in which governing bodies have, and handball might be uh, as guilty as this as anyone else, of how we decide whether or not someone can coach, is often what we'll do is we'll look at the behaviours of the coach and we'll look at the consequence that that brings. So if we go something as simple as, um, I, I watch, you know, I watch football, I watch it, I see my team lose, so therefore I'm going to give my coach some grief. And I might have seen a bit of their behaviours. So I'm, I'm basically using the consequence of their behaviours as being my, my guide as to whether or not this person could do their job or not. If you then progress on from that relatively simplistic uh, view of, of fandom, we might then look at coach education and coach education that has had a, a long uh, history of having a tick box and looking at what a coach does, looking for the consequence of what that coach does and deciding whether or not that coach is competent. Now, in both of those situations, it doesn't take account of where did the behavior come from, as in what was the decision and what informed that decision. So it doesn't really get into the, the cause of the behavior. It just assumes that if we look at a behavior, we can make an assumption about what that meant. Um, and if you look at the evidence around this, it shows it's not particularly helpful. Um, and that actually the thing which really we should be getting into is what are people looking for and why and listening for and why and reading and how does that inform the judgments and how does that judgment inform their decisions? So if I go back to thinking about, well, I've got a session with a group of children, I might simply go, well, my judgment's going to be is I'd like them to, to enjoy themselves. Um, and I'd like them to be busy. So, but I'm not getting to, but why do I want them to enjoy themselves and why do I want them to be busy? And I might then go, if I know a bit more, and go, well, not only do I want them to enjoy themselves and be busy, I want them to start to progress onto a, a learning pathway because it's not just one session, it's one session in a, in, you know, within a, a meso cycle of 10 sessions. So I'm expecting this session to build and build and build over the next few weeks. So I'm now getting into a bit more of a longer term view of things. So actually, if you look at the, the, the behavior of me or the kids I'm coaching in a single session, it's not really that helpful because this is part of a longer term project. And then I might go beyond that and say, well, actually, it's not even just a session within a few sessions. It's those few sessions within a year, within a few years. So, you know, for coaches who get involved in um, cyclical based coaching, such as the Olympic cycle, which I know handball part of the Olympic cycle, then that has a massive bearing on the way in which I'm going to make judgments about what I do with people. But equally, if I'm in a, uh, working with a team in a handball situation, which is in a league and isn't a cyclical four-year situation, it's I need to keep winning, otherwise people are going to question my capacity, then the, again, the problem changes. But each time the problem or context changes, that obviously, to me at least, has an impact on the judgments and decisions that I'm going to be making in terms of what it is I think I'm trying to achieve. Um, so as a result, what we get into is that it's not just a single judgment, it's multiple judgments building on each other over time and, and, um, and responsive to the, to the things which come back to me. And if we then get into that, we then get into this idea that it's judgment and decision making with a consequence, but those consequences should be aligned with the goals that we're working towards. And the more that we can do that, the more we start to progress into something called professional competence. Uh, and I'll come back to professional comments a little bit later on, but hopefully that's making some sense about what do we mean by coaching? Well, a coach doing their job is coaching. And when a coach does their job, they are perceiving, forming judgments, making decisions, creating behaviours, those behaviours are a consequence, and then we get back into it again. So that is coaching at its most basic sense. So when we, uh, if you to start to think about this a bit more simplistically, what we talk about is that actually if we think about the real world then we think about stuff and we do stuff 
and that's that's it that's what we do and it, you can actually change it from coaching to teaching to being a doctor to driving a forklift all of these things require us to think about something and then do something so there's a connection between our thinking and our doing what academia has been brilliant at is reinventing that and calling it theory and practice um, but it's realistically the same thing so that if we think about it there is theory practice thinking doing so what we tend to look at is what's the comparison between the theory and the thinking and the practice and the doing and i'll come to this in a second but it, what you, if you follow the, the line on this when people talk about a theory practice gap there isn't a theory practice gap there's a gap between what this person over here who's done lots of research has and has a theory about and what this person thinking about when we talk about a theory practice gap, we almost take the, the, in this situation, the practitioner out of the equation, say, you're the dumb idiot who doesn't know this. So there's a, there's, a, there's a gap between my theory and your practice. And sod what you think, because it's what you think isn't important, because you should know my theory, which is just it, painfully stupid. Um, and uh, ironically enough, it's lacking a, theoret a theoretical approach of understanding how learning works or even how practice works. So generally speaking, we might be looking at, instead of a theory practice gap, we might be looking at a gap between someone else's theory and the way in which we think about the world. Um, and that might be a quite useful way for us to, to get some ownership over this. Um, but fundamentally, uh, that's, that's the situation. There is one other wrinkle with this, which is, um, there's a phrase which is something like, uh, real life has problems, universities have departments, which, you know, again, it essentially talk, looks at the way in which um, academia likes to split things up into, into different bits. But ultimately, those bits have to fit, up, fit back together in some way or other anyway. So even when someone says there's a theory practice gap, there's probably a theory practice gap from their little bit of theory of the world. As in, I'm an academic, I have a theory, some theory of the world, but it's not every theory of the world. So even then, it's a bit ironic when we get into it. So I think it's useful for us to think about us thinking and doing and perhaps compare and contrast that with this idea of theory and practice. So this is where this um, phrase comes from. There's nothing more practical than a good theory. Um, and if we, if, if we get into this, it's this, this idea that there's, there's a myth that there is a gap between theory and practice in, in coaching. If we get into this, if we think about this a bit more clearly, if we look at some simple definition of what we mean by theory, it's a set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. Um, an idea used to account for a situation or justify a course of action. They allow us to explain or predict something and to have a confidence in the theory, we should test its capacity to explain and predict. Now, I might be a coach and never go on any coach education program I'd never go into a university, but go out and deliver something which would meet all of those situations. So therefore, I presumably got a theory for my practice. Um, so I'm just reading that. It's, it's, that works very well in practice, but how does it work in theory? Well, yeah, it's the spot on the same thing, really, isn't it? So. So I think this is why to me it is a myth that if, as long as I've got a reason for doing why I'm doing what I'm doing, I therefore have a theory in its broadest sense. So there is nothing more practical than good theory. And so as a result, when we get into this, there isn't coaching and if we want to look at coach development, as long as someone's doing something for a reason, it's not a theoretical, it has a theory. A, there is a, a set of principles on which I'm doing this. Um, and because I've done this a few times, I probably have tested it a little bit. And I think it does explain because if it didn't explain, I wouldn't use it. Um, so from that perspective, often, you know, a coaching isn't a theoretical. So that sort of gets us into, well, where's this going? Because um, it seems to say that we, we don't need to engage with academia to think about any of this. And I suppose that's the bit where I'm going to prime justify that a little bit. Um, these guys, Yates and Shearhart, talk about two types of knowledge they talk about formalistic and substantive i've changed that a little bit because there's other words used so we might look at theory what type of theory we might look at formal theory and folk theory so if we look at f uh, formal theory being something which um uh, which is experientially sourced so 
and every theory has eventually has, has initially had some basis in someone's experience if you go from newton you know an apple falling on his head and it's ah, right okay there's something going on here there is a the, the the basis of any theory is nearly always grounded in someone's experience which makes them think about oh this is there's something going on here i'm going to go and explore it um, however, with formal theory, eventually for it to be accepted, it is peer reviewed and peer reviews generally through uh, journal articles. Um, I've seen before that on Twitter that one of our master students, a guy called John Pendlebury, works for the RFU, was moaning about the language used in, in uh, academic papers. And I don't think it's unreasonable to do that. But often that language is written for, other, for, the, peer, for the peers who are going to look at that piece of work and decide whether or not it can be published. Um, so often the peers, uh, the peer groups are, are sometimes a bit different. And I think one of the key things for anyone working in, in this idea of the transition between formal into focus is how do we get these peer groups talking together better? So I think John's got a, uh, has got a good point, but there is a reason why papers are written the way they are. It's because that's the peer group that they're being written to. Um, but formal theories should be critically tested as in and robustly tested, they should be explicit, as in the whole of a theory should be able to be written down and, and um, critiqued and rewritten and critiqued and rewritten and so on. Um, it should work in multiple contexts. It should have evidence of validity, as in does it do what it actually says it does? Um, and the reliability, does it do it all the time or, or close to all the time? And Ultimately, it should be the driver of creativity because a good theory explains lots of things. And the more it explains something, the more I should see connections into going, ah, oh, I could do that, or I could do that, or I could do that. So it should drive creativity. Um, folk theory, uh, again, often experientially sourced, in fact, nearly always. It has some level of peer review. It wouldn't survive if people didn't have some belief in it. So there is, there's clearly got to be some level of peer review. But often it's handed down. Um, it's often not particularly critically tested, at least not in a way in which we might expect a formal theory. Um, it's often implicit in, in that it might be a rule of thumb rather than really properly explained and, and really pulled to pieces. It's often contextually bound, um, so it, it might only work in a certain situation. So I've got on the end there, which is we don't do it like that here. So if I might have an idea about how this drill might work and you might look at it and go, well, this is really good in handball. And, you know, Bobby being a, a, a goalkeeping coach might go, this would work really well in football. And they might go, yeah, but it's, the goals are different. That wouldn't work here, Bobby. And you go, are you sure? So often these theories do tend to get contextually bound. Um, so as a result, they, they often lack the validity and reliability that a strong testing process will bring. And they can be restrictive of creativity because they, they are so contextually bound that people don't like changing them. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they're not good. So often, um, the, for example, the work we're doing with the Football Association, there are, there's a few people on that. They're on doing a, a, a postgraduate diploma, and there's a few people on that program who haven't done a degree but they are really well respected in their field and they come with a great deal of experience. With that experience, clearly, because they think a bit, there's always some level of folk theory. And often that folk theory often isn't very different from what formal theory might say. In fact, it might be exactly the same. So you get a sense of, oh, right, I see how that works. So that gives me a bit more, and this is a word we hear a lot, is that explains that. So people might already have had that rule of thumb but the formal theory might bring a greater level of depth to the explanation. doesn't mean that what they're thinking changes particularly. Um, so it doesn't, so just to reiterate, folk theory is not a bad thing. In fact, it, it is everywhere. We can't ignore it. But it's whether or not we might want to think about, well, how robust is that theory for my practice? So if I'm going to try and predict something, does my theory really allow me to do that? Does it really explain everything I, I, I'm aware of? And should I perhaps go and test that a bit more? So when we get into that, um, this is us trying to, this is some work that I've completed with Sergio Larabethial through the International Council for Coaching Excellence, I think it's called, where we try to pulse with this together in terms of, well, if we were to look at the primary functions, 
what are the professional competences that people have, the professional skills, and then what is the theory and ideas which underpin those. So if we were to look, for example, at um, probably one of the more complex ones, which is design, implement, monitor, evaluate, and regulate advanced training and competition programs with, that are congruent with participant needs and entitlement. So essentially, if I'm working in an Olympic program, we might, you know, I don't know if you've been um, keeping up with the media where uh, there's been some more gymnasts of, of, um, who have uh, been talking about their experiences, about what it's like to be a gymnast in, in high performance settings. And actually what you see is a number of those, those things, particularly participant need and entitlement being, I don't know, I'm not gonna say ignored, but certainly not being taken as much of account of as, as perhaps it should be. Uh, and that's happened a few times. But if we look at that, then we're getting into the idea around ethical practice, which means we might get into, if we look across on this side, understanding the participants, ethics should be part of that. Understanding the context, ethics should be part of that. Um, but equally, I can't design, implement, monitor, evaluate, regulate, advanced training if I don't have some understanding of the participant and the sport and the context of that sport and how many co competitions I'm going to go to. Is it a weekly competition? Is it a... Uh, bi-weekly is it um, is it a festival every every six months or so is it a European competition those sorts of things so all of those things require us to have theories of the pedagogy the participants um, the context uh, the sport those those having an awareness of those things allows me to start answering a central problem of designing something so that I can help us achieve our my prime one of my primary functions which is setting and achieving goals so there's a flow through from the theory through to the role and there's a role which is underpinned by the skills and the theories so it's it's a backwards and forwards process um, so yes there is a need for us to have theories in each of those areas and the theories exist so there's formal theories that exist in each of those six um, knowledge domains but there's also if i was to come and uh, if you were to explore your own practice where you might go I'm not sure I've got a formal theory for that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I know why I do what I do, that it's like you've got a folk theory of that. And the question might be is how robust is your folk theory and would you want to test that a bit more? And that's something that perhaps going into the, for one of a better term, the, the more formal literature might allow you to do or engaging in more formal education might allow you to do. But if I was to finish on this point, in terms of if you were looking at formal education, um, that formal education shouldn't just simply be about the teaching of theory because that's, that's not good education. It wouldn't be someone practicing what they preach. It should be a, an, an opportunity for you to explore your practice against theory, which may or may not match your, um, match your understanding of the world. And if it doesn't, it's okay. You can move on to a different theory. Um, and I think that's probably just about half an hour. So it's probably as good a point to, to stop and, See if there's any questions and somewhere for us to go next. Is that, is that okay, Bobby? I'm on mute, Andrew. Yeah, sorry, that's great. Um, thanks for for that. Um, Ricardo, assume nothing's coming to the chat box or directly to you as sometimes does? Nothing yet, no. Okay, cool. Then um, I'll kick things off uh, if that's okay. And the question I want to start with is, um, is your own coaching practice, Andy. Uh, yep. You mentioned you coach your son's under 13 rugby team. Yep. And I'm, I'm keen to, to know how you would go about working with, with that group because you've, put, you know, you, you, you work in the, the academic space. Um, mm. And I think a criticism that a lot of academics get is sometimes you don't, you, but you don't work in, the, you don't work on the grass or you don't work on the court and stuff. So I'm really always interested to see when you put on Twitter, that you've been out coaching your boys' team, what it, mm. what that looks like. So, could you give us a flavour of how you might plan, reflect, um, any models that you might use for you to uh, set your sessions up, session design, and so on? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, it, it's actually an interesting question, Bobby. I've, I've spoken about this in other areas. Is that whilst I consider, you know, I, I don't want to blow smoke up my own backside, um, although sometimes I have to because no one else does, but. Um, I do think I'm a good coach educator, but I class myself as a relatively novice coach. Uh, and I say that because I don't have a great deal of experience of coaching um, 
I've done, uh, I've been working with the, the team that you're talking about, the under, th so the, like I said, the under 14s, but I've been with them since the under, uh, since they were under sixes. Now that might sound like a long time and it is, but actually when I break it down, it probably equates to about, I don't know, maybe 50 hours a year. Um, yeah. Once you add it all up, so, you know, a one hour session, well, even it was only when we hit under 11s that we started doing a, a midweek session, otherwise it was just two hours on a Sunday. So when you add it all up, it, it probably in terms of on the grass with them, um, and a good chunk of that on the grass is just them playing a game against another team anyway, so there's not a great deal you're doing within that, you're just rotating players. So it's not a great deal of, of hours. Um, and because of that, so there's me initially getting into one of the things you're talking about is understand the context. Um, there's only so much I can do in the time that, that I've got. So therefore, when I get into understand the sport, I do have a, I try to structure my understanding of the sport around it's an invasion sport uh, where we have the ball or we don't have the ball. So the skills that we have should have when we have the ball and the skills that we should have when we don't have the ball. And then rugby being the way it is, there's, some, there's that bit in the middle where there's some skills you need to contest the ball. But even then, it's, you've either got it or you haven't. Um, now, I do that. That's, that's called, um, when you get into it, that's called scaffolding your sport. So how well do you understand your sport in terms of breaking it down into its constituent parts so you can work on something? Um, so one of the things I'm very clear on is trying to avoid firefighting. Um, the, you know, with such a limited amount of time, um, I'm, you know, I, I probably rein back on the ambition about what we can do. Now, luckily, a lot, of the, a lot of the boys I coach also play for the school, but not all of them do, either because the school, they don't play for the school or their school that they're at don't play rugby. Um, but, you know, I, it, I rein in the ambition of what we can do, but, but you could easily overwhelm the kids very, very easily because rugby is a complex sport. So, um, so from a pedagogical view, I'm looking and going, well, I've got a year. It looks like a year, but it's not. It's probably about 50 hours. What can I do in that time frame over the next year? So we might look at, you know, three or four core concepts in that time. Uh, and, and because kids are clever, they'll pick up other stuff anyway just by playing the game. Um, you know, I, I think not everything I coach is going to be everything that they learn. Uh, the, the, they'll, learn they'll learn plenty without me. Um, so that's perhaps looking at the longer term view. Then when it comes to a session point of view, to be honest, I, I don't veer too far away the way in which the RFU deliver it. I mean, I, I've said to the RFU, I don't think they explain the sport well enough um, because I think they, they uh, I tweeted about this uh, yesterday, which is, there's been this sense of, oh, it's, we've, we've talked too much in coach education about the what, we need to get much more into the how skills. But, you know, there's, there's no point for me talking about the how skills if you haven't got a clear view of what it is you want to teach. So if I don't know what I'm going to teach, I, I might be the nicest person ever, but I'm still talking nonsense. Um, so, uh, so I think the RFU do a good job of saying, here's some how skills, which is essentially have a game zone and have a skill zone spend more time in the game zone. I think that's perfectly legitimate advice. As in, and if I've got a good view about what we're trying to learn through the game, um, which like, like I say, goes back to my understanding of the game, then as long as we stick to that, that sort of recipe for across a year and not try and influence too many new things and perhaps do some skill zone stuff with individual players or with two or three players at a time whilst other players keep just playing the game, that's probably as much as I can do. But if you came and watched the session that I was delivering, going back to that, well, I, I'll assess your capacity as a coach by watching it, there's probably no way you'd look at that and go, yeah, the person delivering that has got a PhD in, in coaching. Because it just, it'll just look like everyone else's coaching session. And I think that's one of the things I have to remind myself about is that it doesn't have to look like it's all singing or dancing because actually if it is that then you're probably confusing the kids anyway because you've only got them for an hour a week um so but what i'd like to think is the judgments i've gone through have led to that coaching session that you're watching being very deliberate what it's what it's trying to achieve um but you wouldn't get that unless you came and asked the question that you've just asked which is how do you do how do you get into your coaching so Hopefully that gives you a sense of it and how I'm trying to practice what I preach with that as well. It does, yeah. And uh, one of the points you made, Andy, that really struck a chord with me is that the players are going to learn more than you coach. 
which I thought was brilliant. Um, and it's made me wonder about your experiences of being on the grass as a coach. So is that the same if we pop you into that context of, of coaching and, and doing? Um, all the stuff that you know that you've come across in your uh, research and, and your reading and now in that practical environment you've are you learning more than you've been taught just because you've been plopped in that environment does that make any sense does that question make sense to you yeah it's I, I get what you're saying um i think this comes back to one of the things i was talking before about what do theories do theories allow us to explain the world that we that we sit within um, now, I could sit in that world for 10 years without the theory I need to explain it and never really understand what the hell I'm seeing. So what a good theory should allow me to do is understand what I'm seeing. So I, you know, I, I played football um, you know, probably quite seriously until I was 22. Um, and I look back at it now and think, no one ever actually coached me football. I didn't understand football. Um, because no one ever taught me the, the, the way in which the game works in terms of that idea of an opposition. And, you know, when you haven't got the ball, there's certain things we should be trying to do. When we do have the ball, there's certain things we should be trying to do. And actually, your behaviour should play off this person's behaviour. I just played football. Now, in hindsight, I'm quite glad that was the case because actually I did just like playing football. But it's it, taking that lack of understanding and now putting me into a football coaching context, which is probably true for an awful lot of football coaches. I didn't understand football well enough to coach it well. Um, so coming back to what you're saying, I think the, the question is, is the, the majority of learning that happens is not mediated. So I don't know if you come across this, there's unmediated and mediated or augmented or not augmented. That, that, you know, classic example of academics coming up with words going, what the hell do you mean? Essentially it means there is learning where there is someone there to support you and then there's learning that happens then when someone isn't there to support you. So mediated, there's a coach, unmediated, it's just kids playing. Um, and we know that a huge amount of time is spent in unmediated in situations. So one of the things that I might want to think about as a coach is what am I leaving you with for you to go away and do your, when you're in an unmediated situation that you will continue to try and work in a way that you wouldn't have worked if I hadn't given you that idea. And I think it's exactly the same in coach education, is most of your coach, especially the way that uh, at level one, level two, where, you know, the, um, but even beyond that, uh, is the majority of the time that that person engages in this thing you want to be better at will be unmediated. So what am I giving you to help you make better sense of that coaching situation? So that when you go out and deliver, um, you're trying to do something. So long-winded, um, so you're, you're trying to do something deliberately. So there's this phrase about deliberate practice. So when I go out and deliver, I've probably gone out and delivered far more deliberately than I would have done if I'd have just been, um, as in my co-coaches, who are just out to be of the, some of the kids on the, on the team, they turn up with this, well, we did this drill when I was a kid, so let's do that. There's not a great deal of delib deliberateness about that. It's just I'm going to pull this one in and, and use it. And that's that example of a folk theory being used. But is it really that helpful is, is the question you get into. Yeah, really interesting, uh, Andrew. And some of the stuff that you've just been mentioning there has um, uh, resonated with me, especially around this uh, notion of unmediated or mediated um, environments. Um, and it, the mediated stuff reminded me of Marco Sullivan's uh, quote around um, adding value to the player's experience. So this <clears throat> thing in AIK Stockholm in uh, Sweden is, uh, you know, it doesn't want the coaches to step in unless they're adding value. Is that something that you you connect to that as well, that mediated, unmediated um, context? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, well, if, if we'd have do this, um, I don't know if you remember, Bobby, but when we did this as part of the Masters, one of the questions I ask is, think about the last time you said something to, a, to an athlete and tell, and can you tell me why you said it and what's the evidence for it? And it, it, it's that challenge about saying, if you're going to say something, make sure it's worthwhile. Otherwise, you, you're just creating white noise. Or you could actually say something which, which restricts someone's development. Um, so, yeah, so if, you, you, if you're going to say something, make sure that it's something that is going to be useful for that player. Um, and that's difficult. And I mean, it, sound, it, it makes us sound like all oh, coaches are, don't know what they're talking about. 
I'll just go back to, it's an example I've used a few times, and it go, again goes back to my, you know, I played football, and I still play football now. Um, and I tried to teach my son how to kick a rugby ball because he's not, an, he didn't have a natural um, kicking cycle that you, you know, some kids just do it very quickly. He didn't. So, and I was watching him going, I'm going to have to try and intervene here. So as she was saying, if I'm going to say something to make sure it's worthwhile, I spent an hour with him talking absolute crap to him. <laughs> and it was, because I, I, and I only, I know that because I, I sort of got a sense in my head about going, is this right? Is what I'm saying to him right here? And then I just went in and got a video up from YouTube, just slowed it down and looked and thought, no, I've just talked complete nonsense to him for the last hour. And I've, you know, I'm a PhD in, in, uh, in sport coaching. I played football for, you know, 40 odd years and I don't know how to kick a ball. And, and that just spoke about my lack of, understanding of the theory of kicking a ball so my understanding of the sport it was on such a fundamental level it was completely lacking so in that instance i didn't step in and give him anything useful <laughs> i thought it could be the exact opposite to be honest Andy, i'm um, sorry for for interrupting and uh, just picking up on on the point you and bobby were just making about the unmediated context of learning um there was there's an interesting question um uh, an interesting doubt that came uh, with the comments you guys were making around providing those moments inside the session. Uh, so although the coach is there, um, do, you, do you find there are moments in the session where you can actually, whether it's through silence or you know, make yourself unnoticed, that you can promote and provide those moments of unmediated learning, even though the coach is present, uh, but through maybe inaction or um you know just allow the learners to do that discovery and to explore yeah. Those, that yeah with, with you yeah um yes you can i think um uh i've got a a straightforward answer to this and i've got a smart smart answer <laughs> uh, sorry smart aleck answer to it as well the straightforward answer is yeah of course you, you can just say look there's a ball guys off you go um the, the problem with some of mine is they'll just start throwing mud at each other if it's been raining. Um, which, you know, if that's, if that's what they enjoy. But you're sort of looking, oh, it's meant to be an hour of rugby, so I'm, I'm trying to put some boundaries on that. Um, but there are examples, I know that uh, some of the football clubs who run academies run evenings where they do just say to the players, just go and play, we're not going to say anything, we're just going to let you get on with it. I'm not so sure that's as easy within a community setting if you're trying to facilitate their learning. Is that if you've only got an hour, you need to make the most of that hour, I think. Um, and that's what I tell myself when I, you know, when I'm feeling like I'm getting a bit grumpy with the kids that I'm coaching, that um, because they are just messing about a bit, I'm going, Look, we've got an hour, you know, it's, it's, this is only an hour of everyone's time. Let's, let's make it a good hour of, of, of skill. But, but, to answer this, the, the, this, the question you, you provided there, um, Ricky, is, yeah, of course you can just set up a situation which is unmediated. Um, the bit I, where I get into the smart, smart Alec bit of this is that the idea of um, player-centered coaching. Um, now, to me, as soon as you put on a session, it is no longer player centered because a coach has made the decision that that's what that session is going to do. Um, so it is not 100% player centered. As much as I'm saying to myself, well, I'm, I'm allowing you to take this on. The point is, it's still you to allow that to happen. If, if it was really you know, player centered, it would, it would be 100% unmediated. So even if I decided to make something unmediated, I still decided that. There might actually be a, um, a, a kid in that, to, in, in that session who's looking at you going, but I don't want it to be a mediator. I want you to come and help me. Uh, yes, but I'm allowing you to just go and play. Yeah, but if you were try child-centered, you would, you would listen to me and come and help me. So it's, it's that, sort of, that sort of sense of just being a bit critical about what some of these terms mean, in that we feel like by doing that, we're meeting children's needs. And we probably are to a good extent, but... You know, I'm always wary of thinking, well, I've, I've decided for you that it's good for you just to have unmediated play. Well, it's still, yeah. therefore, it's, it's been, that decision has been mediated. So it's just one of those 
those wrinkles that I get a bit upset about sometimes, which I should probably spend less time worrying about, to be honest. <laughs> Bobby, then, you yeah, yeah, can. Can. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on there. there. There's some stuff, lots of stuff in that answer that's, um, again, struck a chord with me. Um, but one of the questions that's coming from the chat is probably an opportune moment. And uh, Nathan, can I ask you to unmute and you ask it, please? Uh, Nathan's a former colleague of mine from MK Thumbs, um, and I'd like him to uh, ask it in his own words if possible. You right to do that, Nathan? Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me now? Or? Yes, mate, go ahead. Yeah, so no, I was just asking, um, what does the process look like when you're delivering the. Um, oh, sorry. Do you allow the players to understand and see what the process looks like in terms of how you're going to coach the players? And then also, what does that process look like? Is it more visual for your players? Is it audio? And then what's the time span around um, the process for the players? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a, a great question, to, uh, Nathan. It's the research, all the research says, the, the more control people feel like they've got over something, the, the, the more value they potentially see in it. Now, there are some nuances around that, but we keep going with that. So ultimately, player understanding, I think, is crucial. Um, so the, the next question is how much and when. Um, so I, if I was to look at me with one hour a week, if I was to spend too much time in that hour trying to help them understand why they were doing what they were doing, they'll probably get upset them not playing rugby, especially if it's cold. If I had more time uh, and had some indoor space, which I don't have, uh, then I would probably spend more time talking to them about why they are doing what they are doing because the, when you get into it, what, if you think the theory around why is called declarative knowledge. So the more we understand why we do something, the more control we have over it. So, and therefore, if I have control over it and I'm curious about it, I'm more likely to carry on with it. Um, now, there is, so again, some news around that about how much why do we give someone around technique? Because actually, you know, we, if you look at the research around um, declarative knowledge and let's say kicking a ball is that it can interfere with the natural action of kicking a ball. Um, but you might explain that to someone so they're still getting a reason why you're not giving them too much information. Uh, although having said that, the research also suggests once people get a really good level of um, understanding, sorry, a really good level of technical prowess, then you can start in introducing some declarative knowledge because they will start to self-analyze anyway and self-diagnose. So it's actually useful for them to have the information to make sure they don't do something uh, stupid. Um, so coming back to the fundamental overall question you're asking, Nathan, I think it is important that um, players understand the process that they are going through, because then it's something that's being done with them rather than something that's being done to them. And then they are more likely, if they want, if they're really into it, they're then more likely to go away and practice better when you're not there. So that's, I think that's what the research would, would back that, that view up. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Nathan, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, yeah, some good stuff there. Uh, something I wanted to talk about previous to, um, to that question is when you were talking about the, the, your process going through coaching your son um, and your, the realisation, your eureka moment that you didn't know what you were talking about. That self-awareness and yeah. that reflection um, process I think is really interesting and I've, we had Matt Joseph on last week Andrew I know you know from um, working with the, the FA um, yeah, yeah. and he was talking about that uh, helping coaches discover that that self-awareness is there any advice that you can give on uh, to, to co the coaches on here and coaches that would be listening afterwards on on their promoting self-awareness and reflection yeah probably a number of things um, firstly um, does it feel safe to do it? Um, you know, the, often when we get into reflections and self-awareness, we're, we're starting to open ourselves up to some vulnerability. We're starting to um, acknowledge. So if I could just, so I've realized we're doing all this and I've still got this slide up. I'm just going to bring up another slide. Um, uh, which is, um, So yeah, so just carry on. So generally speaking, that level of self-awareness requires that your capacity to be feel vulnerable. So if, if, if I've been brought up in a, 
uh, in, in a situation in a sport where vulnerability is frowned upon, then even if I want to be a critical self uh, uh, and being critically self-aware, if I don't feel like the environment supports that, I'm not going to show you that I'm doing it. Um, and actually, it might even slow down how much I do it. So number one is, does the context really drive that, that willingness to, to share with each other? Um, the second one would be, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, as in essentially people don't know what they don't know until they know what they don't know. Um, so one of the biggest things I think from for most people eventually is to realize that there's a whole load of stuff that they don't know, you know, me as much as anyone else. Um, which again gives us a reason why we go to mediated learning to, because that X starts to really sh show up what we don't know. If I go work with an expert in something about something I know little about, they're probably going to open up a whole world that I wasn't aware of. Um, but if I'm self aware enough to go, I know I don't know something about this, I should go and explore it, then you know, that's, that's a good start as well. Um, but I think some of the key things is, is about uh, this is the, some work by, um, I haven't got a reference on that. Um, uh, some guys who work in the field of naturalistic decision making. Uh, and they talk about it as being uncertainty. So if you look at the, the work of Donald Sean, he talks about one of the things that happens is we often reflect when we're surprised. And typically, uh, a moment of surprise is also aligned with a moment of uncertainty. Um, so these guys talk about uh, three major forms of uncertainty. Um, now, again, it, it actually we have to acknowledge that we've, we've got uncertainty, but they typically talk about that we acknowledge that we've got a lack of understanding about something, or we've got a, a lack of information about something, or... Um, I know there's two or three things I could do here and at the moment all I'm going to do is guess because I don't really know how to decide which one of these is the best. Um, so what they then go into saying is that well clearly one of the things that we can do is if we if we feel like we haven't got enough information we should start collecting more information. So for example if we if we look at a player who's really starting to cheese us off it may well be that our, our natural response to that would be to essentially bollock them a little bit, rather than perhaps going, but why are they doing that? I don't understand why they're not doing that. And if you don't understand it, well, there's initial something. And if you don't understand it because you're going, I don't know what's going on in their lives, then you've got a lack of information. So immediately there's two reflection points there to get into, as in, well, why do I think, why do I immediately assume you're a naughty kid? Are you really, or is it perhaps my coaching, or is it because um, I, I've got a, um, uh, a lad who's, um, who's, whose dad is really not very well at all, and that's been the case for a few years. Now, he's a, he's a lovely guy, but he doesn't listen a hell of a lot. Um, uh, and then I have to be aware of that. Is it because, is it well, he's just a 12-year-old boy and actually, uh, do, I, do I put that on him too much? Because actually, he's just like everyone else who's on the team. There's, a lot of them don't listen a lot. So it's those sorts of questions that we, that we have to ask ourselves that, um, that lead us to, you know, to recognise there's some uncertainty in our practice. And that uncertainty should therefore drive the reflection of it. So in short, if you, if you recognise the uncertainty in your practice, like I did with my summer, I'm going, is, that, is, is the stuff I've just said to him any good? Because I don't think it is. And then I go and find out, no, it really isn't. Then there was a reflection point for me. And it was a big moment that surprised me to go, God, I really don't know much about football. That's um, really interesting, Andrew. And it, it's just reminded me of when um, I first started my projects with you guys at Leeds Beckett, uh, with Bob Muir. And I think his work, well, his particular... Um, uh, terminology was around expectations. Are your expectations of the practice you're delivering or the session you're delivering being fulfilled? Are they being met? And if your expectations aren't being met, then why not? And how? And that that kind of um, then being surprised by, oh wow, I actually thought this practice I was going to put on was going to go like this, and actually it's going like yes. that. And <laughs> that can also be a positive and a negative, depending on how the, the obviously yeah. pans out. But um, I think that's a really interesting thing that coaches could take away from this one is, you know, what are you expecting to see and what are you surprised by in the practice that you're delivering? Um, Ricardo, actually, I'm, sorry, Andy, go on. I was just going to say what, what you've just explained there is also one of the reasons why relative novices 
struggle with reflection is because they have so few expectations. So it's difficult to be surprised. In, in other words, it's, um, you often need to generate enough of a, a level of experience to actually notice things going on mm. in order for you to be surprised, in order for you to reflect. So it, it is one of the reasons why novices um, struggle with it. That's great. Um, Ricardo, I've got one more question. I don't know if you've got anything that you want to... Nothing on the chat yet. Go on. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to pull you back, Andy, to the, this notion of vulnerability, um, because it's something that I've uh, wrestled with myself um, probably before I started my work with you guys. And um, I've got my ideas on how we can promote it in coaches and get, you know, develop a culture for it. But can you provide any insights into how coaches can sort of nurture that um, that aspect uh, within the players and um, I mean often as coaches we're supposed to be their all-knowing um, beings you know we, we've got all the mm. answers but actually that's not the case so can you can you shed any light on that for us? Yeah yeah um, the simple start to it is is, is the same as anything if I, if I want you to um, learn how to kick I might show you how to kick I might show you and it's called demonstration. So if I want you to learn to be vulnerable, I'm going to have to show you. Um, so there's, I think there's, you know, initially it's about modeling it, is that you model your own vulnerability. You, you, you allow people to see that you are uncertain about certain things. Um, and I think that's as true for play, working with players as it is working with coaches, um, is that people are allowed to question things without someone, you know, suddenly taking a huff and wandering off, and you know, or... Or, or essentially get into some sort of uh, shouting match or whatever. It's, I think fundamentally it's can you model the, the things that you want others to copy? Um, and once you've got that in place, and you under, in fact, there's another thing. Do, you, do we understand why we want to model vulnerability? Because if we don't, then you sort of go, well, why am I doing this? So one of the things that we know um, uh, around vulnerability is it, it's a fundamental tenet of trust is people tend not to trust other people if they never see, get some sense of vulnerability from them. Um, so I think we'd agree that actually building tr trust is a really crucial thing that we can do. Um, and, that, uh, and so therefore there is a good, really good reason why we should model vulnerability because it is one of the things which will build trust. And as soon as we've got trust, now we can get into some things. So if you, if you think about some of the things that we've been seeing in the, um, some of the commentary from, I can't remember the, the gymnast's name, but, but saying that, you know, she was constantly feeling sick about having to get on the scales. Now, standing on scales makes someone look incredibly vulnerable. And she clearly didn't trust that that was something that was in her, that was in her interests. Probably because no one ever taught, oh, well, again, probably. I don't know, I wasn't there. But we might think about, has anyone ever really explained to them why they need to go on the scales every day? And actually, did anyone ever even think about, was that even a good idea in the first place? Um, because if we don't notice that that's making someone feel incredibly vulnerable, and we don't then um, have a, an environment which allows that person to say, look, this is really making me feel uncomfortable, by the way, then there's a clear issue with trust in that situation, which that coach may never have even been aware of. But although, again, I, I'm sort of a guess that some doesn't see asking a, uh, a, a young adolescent girl standing on scales every day isn't a bit of an issue. But, yeah. um, uh, but, but that's an example of where that might be, where it comes in. So, yeah, I think it is really crucial that we acknowledge everyone's vulnerabilities, what will make people feel vulnerable. And then you get into this idea of empathy. Can you put yourself in their shoes? Those sorts of things. Um, but I think it, a core, if I, if I look for, for core working tools, I think trust is fundamental to any successful environment and vulnerability is crucial to, uh, to trust. And therefore, we have to be able to model it and, and see it without, throughout. And part of vulnerability is allowing ourselves to be questioned. Um, I think that's and, really interesting and some yeah, really deep points on that i'm going to try to bring it back to um perhaps our context and and, and handball delivery so yeah. i'm going to share some of my experiences with trying to model vulnerability as a as a handball coach um and one of the reasons i think it's important as well like you were saying is 
if I can show that I'm vulnerable in what I'm about to deliver to the kids, when I'm asking them questions, they can feel psychologically safe in their yeah. responses yeah. Um, and not feel like I'm going to be scrutinizing their every, every word, which I think probably when I was a younger coach, I probably did quite a lot and uh, didn't foster that. So when, when um, probably about six years ago, I started wrestling with the idea of constraints led practice um, and um, the early sort of, of reading of ecological dynamics and all that kind of uh, mm -hmm. ecological psychology and stuff and started experimenting heavily with my session design and started, started moving goals. Um, I put one goal on the edge of the, it's mean nothing to you, Andy, but to the handball coaches, it might uh, move one handball goal onto the edge of the six meter facing the other goal, swap the wingers around, said the, 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 the right-handed player, uh, right-handed winger was standing in the left wing, uh, in the right wing position and vice versa. And they had to shoot into the goal that was on the edge of the six meter. And the other three backcourt players have to shoot over the top of the goal that was on the six meter. But I said to the players, like, I've got no idea what these rules that I've done, how I've set this court, this court up. I don't, I don't know how it's going to play out. You know, it might, it might end up looking stupid, but I want you guys to have a little bit of trust in what I'm about to do. And if it goes wrong, then we'll change it. And you know, maybe you can help me change it. So a little bit of co-creation with that. And um, mm. sure enough, 20 minutes later, we were having a, a fantastic session because the players were chipping in with some ideas. Um, the practice actually did work out how I wanted it to um in terms of my expectations but it could have and, and it has plenty of times fallen flat on its face and we've had to change it completely and, and go back to square one but that example of just being honest with the players and saying i don't know what's going to happen next but let's see what happens and, and we'll go with it as a team does that make sense yeah it does and i think it, it, you, what you've done there is actually captured a lot of the things we've just been talking about which is number one is you had a theory and you tested it uh, number two, you talked to the players about the process and what they were going to do, so got them engaged in the process, so hey presto, they're suddenly a bit more involved with it. Um, number three, you've engaged in what Sean would call active ex experimentation, so reflecting in practice, so if you're going in knowing that something might not work, so, so you engage in experimentation and let's try this, let's try this. Uh, so you're actually engaging in a reflective process because you've gone in with some um, uh, being unsure, but you've but with some element of being sure about something, otherwise you you wouldn't try it. But you're going well. I think this will work. Let's go and have a go. So you, you've actually got into a lot of the things we've talked about there, and, you've, and then you've talked about the idea of uncertainty. Going, I think this will work, but until I see what happens, as in get more information, I won't really know. So I think that just that one. Um, I suppose micro story you've just described has captured a lot of the things that we've been talking about in this in, in the whole session. To be honest. Great, thank you, uh, Andrew. Ricardo, is there anything else coming to the chat? I can see something's popped up. No, just from Nathan uh, to us. Um, Ricardo, anything from you before we wrap things up? No, I think it would be you know um, it would be interesting maybe to analyse uh, or or to look at that from a, a coach educated perspective. We, we're all. Uh, most of us in the call um, lead with other coaches and try to somehow uh, feedback, uh, gather feedback from other coaches and give a bit of feedback to other coaches as well. As well. Uh, and not too long ago, in a, in a club context, uh, just this is going back to our formal um, theory and folk theory. Uh, I've come across uh, a coach that essentially was uh, is. From, from Spain, he's, he's had numbers of coaches, different coaches that, um, well, taught him different ways of coaching. Uh, and he is just replicating what he believes are the best uh, bits from each coach and, and applying it in his own practice without really understanding why. Um, and every time, you know, we, you try to, to make a question around why he's doing this or that, comes back with um, a bit of a fixed mindset, which is the answer I guess we'll, we'll always get, which is because it, it works. It always worked that way and it's been used for years like this and it's got you know proven results to be successful on court. Um, I guess my question then is um, how do you break into this? How do you uh, promote a bit more, a, a, a bit more you know, profound discussion around the whys and why is that working? Why are you doing that? And, and how that is impacting your 
your athletes essentially yeah I, I, it's it's interesting because i think what you've just described there is something that we've come across a lot when you go and work with highly experienced people i, I think the it comes back to this idea of vulnerability is one is that uh, vulnerability and trying to build trust so one is you you would value what that person says you know so if that person is coming with a great deal of experience and they have seen it in their view work then they have a folk theory and um and so we, we should respect where that folk theory has come from we shouldn't tell you know this idea of telling someone they're, they're wrong i mean you, there's nothing so certain that we can go up to someone saying you're wrong apart from you know when you when you start to see ethical boundaries being transgressed and there, are, there clearly are some things that are wrong but typically things it's hard to say that's wrong so i think it's personally if i was doing that i'd be trying to draw in their expertise but also show them something else but i'm now asking them to be appear vulnerable which they might not have felt that they've been able to do before so again i'm going to have to I'm going to have to model that vulnerability a bit um, and so I, I model it by saying yes you might know more than I do um, so you know, you're saying something from the outset look I'm happy for you to tell me that I might not be what I'm saying might not be good um, so I, I think there is that process again of, of trying to put yourself in their shoes and why do they behave the way they do well I'm the expert in the room and who are you to come and challenge me well okay I'll acknowledge your expertise but can we have a chat about how this might work and what about this um, now we can try that and that might work and eventually I, th I generally speaking I've, it's very rare where I found that not to work although sometimes it might have taken six months to a year but I, I have that privilege sometimes in that um, you know the programs we work on have that amount of time um, but it, it does say I think it's about having some patience um, but I do also think and I've said this to a few people in the past is you know that phrase change the people or change the people or and that's how I would add change the context or change the context because if eventually you, you know there's only so long you want to bang your head on a brick wall um, before you start going right it's time for me to just change the wall I think um, so I, I don't think there's any sense of saying to people look, just keep persevering keep persevering it's sometimes you i think we we have to find a different way around this around the problem um which may be that we just circum circumnavigate i mean we there's i wrote a paper on this called vampires and wolves um which might be of interest it's on the, my research gate page which talks about there are some coaches who just see themselves as being much better than everyone else and knows and they, there's nothing left for them to learn um and you might now that actually can be true for the very very best coaches but there's other coaches who that isn't true for but they're not going to change so you know ultimately you, you find your way around them you, you, they just become a, a rock in the sea which is going well i'm gonna to have to deal with the rock but eventually i'll just sail around it um and, and find other ways so um and the other thing is that you can that we've talked about and that is if there are sufficiently like-minded people then you start to generate a new way of seeing things so this person either gets on board or they or they start to feel isolated um, and typically people get on board to some extent i think by doing that but i think that's that's further down the line initially it can be i respect your expertise but can we get into a conversation about this that's really thank you, thank you. Thank, thanks Andrew. Uh, guys, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to wrap things up. It's been a, a great discussion from a personal perspective anyway. I always enjoy speaking to you Andy and, and uh, picking your brain. Uh, such a uh, vast amount of knowledge and experience in, in there and um, yeah, just geek out on coaching uh, when, 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 when I um, read your tweets and stuff. Um, guys, I hope the, the session has been informative for you. Um, Andy, is there somewhere that, that these guys can contact you if they have f further questions on reflection after this? Uh, uh, yeah, um, obviously I'm on Twitter, but also uh, email is a.k.abraham at leedsbeckett.ac.uk. I'll send that out in the, in the debrief if that's okay, Andy, yeah, that's so, that, so they can drop, yeah. you, drop you a line and also put your Twitter handle in there as well. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, in, in terms of uh, next week, we're back on. We have got uh, position specific focus next week, and I'm delighted to say we've got uh, Miha Spize joining us from the Slovenian national team, and we've got Frederick Pettersson from the Swedish national team, uh, both top line players, top pivots that are going to be uh, discussing the ins and outs of that position. Um, Thanks very much again, Andrew. Guys, I hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Bye-bye. No problem.